So please welcome Dr. Buntrump as we enter brains, souls, and self, process and identity. Yeah, thanks for having me and also a very warm invitation to come to Munich. The Munich School of Philosophy is right between the university and the English Garden City Park. It's in the middle of everywhere. It's really nice. It's my honor to welcome the first speaker, Dr. Peter Sierstead Hughes. Um, he is a philosopher of mind. He's also a metaphysician. He specializes in Whitehead, Nietzsche, and Spinoza especially. And also, that's how we got to know each other in panpsychism. Uh, he is a lecturer on, at the University of Exeter and published several books, Numenotics, um, and then is co-editor and contributor to the Bloomsbury Philosophy of Psychedelics. Two years ago, almost yeah, two years ago, I taught a seminar on philosophy of mind and new psychedelic research to which he contributed uh, via Zoom and had very interesting things to say. And it's a, it's a very interesting new research field to use psychedelics again for therape therapeutic purposes. So I'm really f looking forward to your talk, Peter. Uh, well, thank you, Gudehard, and um, thank you to the CPS. I'm uh, honored and delighted to be here, and uh, it's very nice to see uh, some old friends and, and make some new ones. Right, so I, I normally talk about um, Whitehead at psychedelic conferences, but today it's the other way around. I'm talking about psychedelics to a Whitehead conference. So um, they'll, I'll mostly be giving you a context in which you might see how Whitehead's metaphysics can be applied in a practical sense, um, both in terms of therapy and beyond that in terms of societal enrichment. It's a conjecture, but uh, bear with me. So, um, yeah, um, it's called, I've called this process psychonautics, Whitehead and psychedelic research. Psychonaut means uh, someone who explores the mind, coined by Ernst Jünger, a German philosopher. So my plan is this. I will, first of all, give you a little bit of history about psychedelic research and therapy, and also then talk about what we're doing today. It's, a, it's an emerging field, psychedelic research, and it's very exciting, I think. Secondly, I'll talk about psychedelic-induced metaphysical experiences, which are, you know, overlap with mystical experiences. I'll make the differentiation. I realize I only have 20 minutes. Um, thirdly, integration. I'll talk about the integration phase of psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy. I'll explain all these terms as we go along. And lastly, I'll, um, I'll give you uh, hints as to how one might apply Whitehead's thought in psychedelic um, therapy, especially in terms of his three Ps, prehension, pan-experientialism, and pa panentheism. Okay, so let's uh, quickly give you an outline of um, psychedelic uh, research. I'm just giving you the Western uh, century, really, but of course, um, psychedelics have been used in terms of therapy and also other uses um, going back thousands of years, especially here in the Americas. Um, peyote, San Pedro, uh, and so on have been used, but that's another talk. So let's zoom into the uh, 20th century. So in 1902, William James published The Varieties of Religious Experience. Um, of course, Whitehead was much inspired by William James. And in this uh, book, um, William James is one of the first really to link mystical experiences with um, those experiences induced by psychoactive drugs. He wasn't the first, a guy called Benjamin Paul Blood um, actually wrote to William James with his um, philosophy of nitrous oxide and metaphysics. But William James made it very, wrote about it in a very elegant manner and made it a, a real topic of interest at the start of the 20th century. There was a flurry of literature um, about this uh, stemming there from. And I should say this was um, about drug-induced psychedelic, uh, or yeah, drug-induced um, mystical experience, but it wasn't at that time illegal, of course. Um, there was that flurry of activity based on James's work, and, and I should say, even today, um, William James really is the bedrock of this field. 
1938, 19, um, Albert Hoffman, the Swiss chemist, synthesized LSD and uh, took it in 1943. He took a huge amount because he was the first one to ever take it and uh, he didn't really know what was uh, considered standard. And uh, he rode a bicycle back home that day, uh, followed by a demon. wasn't particularly pleasant, but afterwards um, it became a very pleasant experience for him. And then later on in life, he uh, got into the philosophy of, with philosophy of the experience with Ernst Jünger, the German philosopher I mentioned. Wrote a book called LSD, My Problem Child, in 1979, which has got a, some in, the last chapters uh, got some interesting um, pantheistic philosophy in it. Uh, 1953, CIA get involved and think, wonder how. Uh, psychedelics can be used for mind control in their project called MK Ultra. Sounds like a conspiracy theory, but it's well documented. Um, 1954, Aldous Huxley publishes The Doors of Perception, which um, was culturally influential about his experiences on mescaline. Therein, he tries to explain it using Bergson's thought via C.D. Broad, but uh, it doesn't really deeply go into it. 1957, Huxley's friend Humphrey Osmond coined the term psychedelic, me meaning mind manifesting. And in that paper, he references William James. And uh, he says, even though he was a psychiatrist, he emphasizes the philosophical importance of these mind manifesting drugs. And um, <clears throat> there was, there was um, some philosophical interest. And they almost... Um, Osmond Huxley almost organized this conference called Outside in the 50s, where they were going to bring 50 of the world's leading intellectuals. They invited Einstein, Jung, many others to take mescaline and then write about it. Unfortunately, they didn't get the funding in the last minute from the Ford Foundation, so it's the greatest thing that never happened in psychedelia. And then you add, go, go forward 10 years, Timothy Leary um, gets expelled from Harvard for giving LSD and psilocybin to his students, it was sort of frowned upon. Um, and uh, a year after that, UK military test LSD for combat as a combat incapacitant, but it was too unpredictable to use um, for combat, so it was sort of neglected. And then, you know, you had various laws. Um, you know, LSD got, was sort of like, went into Western culture like a hand grenade, really, caused havoc. The authorities didn't know what to do, so it was eventually sort of outlawed in 1971 with the UN following uh, Nixon's war on drugs. Um, it wasn't that that prohibition was not really based on scientific evidence or reason. It was a political decision, um, but that's again another another talk. Um, and then, okay, I've missed out the 90s here. I should say in the 1990s, um, certain people got licenses to um, use uh, psychedelics. Rick Strassman, especially, he, he tested um, DMT, the psychedelic drug DMT, to find the neural correlates thereof. It wasn't in terms of therapy. Um, but one thing I've missed is in the 1950s and 70, to the 70s, um, LSD was used as an agent within therapy. So in Europe, you had psycholytic therapy, which was um, small doses of psychedelics, LSD mostly, um, which um, was used as a tool for psychoanalysis mostly. And in parallel in the US, in California especially here, yeah, um, you had psychedelic peak therapy where large doses were administered. And that was quite successful. Um, but nonetheless, because it got into the public and because of uh, sensationalism in the media, nonetheless it was prohibited. Anyways, in the 90s, a few licenses were given. And then in about 10 years ago, um, we entered the so-called psychedelic renaissance. Um, and we're in it now, <laughs> which involves, uh, well... For the last 10 years, there have been um, numerous trials showing that psychedelics can be actually beneficial. They don't melt your brain. They can actually be, on the contrary, quite beneficial um, against ailments such as PTSD, depression, fear, anxiety, OCD, so on and so forth. And um, so, so this, is a, this is a new field of research, um, still early days, again, in a way. We've sort of, we don't use Freud anymore, as, as they did in the sort of mid-20th century. But um, so it, the whole, my whole spiel today, really, is to show that um, psychedelic, that it seems that the most effective therapeutic use of psychedelics is um, when they induce what I will call metaphysical experiences. And at the moment, it's psychiatrists and psychologists who are administering these drugs, but of course they're not trained in metaphysics. 
So it's my contention that if you want to integrate metaphysical experience, you should have recourse to metaphysics. It's almost a tautology, but it doesn't happen. Um, so, so this is ultimately my point, and within that, I'm going to argue that Whitehead's metaphysics in particular is, would be, could be especially um, effective. What do I mean by metaphysical experience then? What do I mean by metaphysics? Well, as uh, Dr. Livingston mentioned, the word metaphysics comes from Aristotle's book, The Metaphysics, which literally means after the physics, because a later editor put this collection of um, texts from Aristotle um, after Aristotle's texts, the physics, right? So meta means after, so it's literally after the physics. And within that book, you've got a sort of program um, which defines the study of metaphysics. He, Aristotle himself, as was mentioned, called it first philosophy. Um, and that's the basis of metaphysics today, um, though it has been developed. So ontology is a core element of metaphysics, the study of being, as uh, we had a lecture on a few hours ago. So ontology, the study of being, so um, in terms of, for example, substance, including process, I should say, right? You recall that Whitehead says that you, he can see um, Spinoza's, he sees his uh, creative impulse as Spinoza's substance, as a way of seeing it. But anyway, so um, within ontology, you have these theories of physicalism, uh, idealism, dualism, neutral monism, the transcendent, and so on. And as well as those theories, um, he, you know, we look at causation, what, what's meant by causation, what's meant by form, qualities like relations, properties, modality, and so on. Also in Aristotle's uh, metaphysics, the yeah, book Lambda is about God. So there is a theism within metaphysics from the start. But as Whitehead said, you know, what, Aristotle was the last metaphysician to present a non-religious God, interestingly. So I've created with um, some colleagues in Exeter this, what I call this metaphys this, well, what I call the metaphysics matrix, um, which might be the basis of metaphysical integration in psychedelic therapy. I'm sure many of you in this learned audience would disagree with the way I've categorized metaphysics. But nonetheless, you know, there's no absolute answer, and this is non-exhaustive, but as you can see, uh, we've got physicalism, idealism, dualism, monism, tra the transcendent, panpsychism. Um, cuts through all of those because, you know, Galen Strawson has a physicalist panpsychism, Leibniz has a kind of idealistic notion of it, and so on. Um, that includes pan-experientialism within it. Um, okay, that's hard to see on this screen. Here's a more basic version of these different options. I just make this, I, in my personal experience, when you speak to, uh, I'm part of the psychology department, as well as philosophy department in Exeter. When I speak to psychologists, and most people on the street, as it were, um, they think there are two metaphysical options, and those are physicalism or dualism. And they don't realize that there's a huge array of different options, even that, of course, is not exhaustive. Um, and there's another one as well, of course, the transcendent. Okay, so that's metaphysics as I understand it. Um, I've spoken about intellectual, what I call intellectual metaphysics, so like systems, well, systems or analysis of things such as causation, substance, and whatever. Um, we have, in the past, I should say, a kind of uh, systematic intellectual metaphysics, so the big systems. You could include Whitehead's system of uh, philosophy of organism as such a system. But in the 20th century, or in the late 20th century, um, after metaphysics was killed off for a while, um, it returned, in the metaphysical turn, about 30 years ago, I suppose, in analytic philosophy, and in that, that, that form of metaphysics, which I've taught at Exeter, um, it's kind of bitty, so you analyze what causation means, for example. You analyze what self-identity means, and so on. It's not the big systems that you had in the past with people like Schopenhauer and Hegel and whatnot. So there's intellectual metaphysics that we, we, we teach at university. Um, but then there's experiential metaphysics as well. Um, William James, for example, writes this. In the nitrous oxide trance, we have a genuine metaphysical revelation. So there's, in other words, two ways of, in, of uh, grasping um, a metaphysical system. One is, yeah, through uh, recourse to reading, studying, and so on. Um, but there are, it seems, direct intuitions that one can have as well. Deleuze, for example, speaks about Spinozism. He says, you can learn Spinoza's metaphysics through, you know, years of study, the ethics especially, or you can have uh, this flash of Spinozism, he says, you know, you can get it in a flash, this pantheistic insight. 
Now, meta mysticism um, is also experiential, mystical states. That's what William James writes about. But it can be doctrinal as well, if we think about people like St. John of the Cross and whatever. Um, but the, what I'm interested in is, is this intersection between mystical states and uh, metaphysical experiential states. There is an overlap. Um, but, of course, there's many parts of metaphysics which are not part of mysticism. For example, the dry study of uh, mental causation, maybe. And then we have a, a third cycle here, psychedelic experience. So there is a variety of psychedelic experiences. There's not just one. Um, there are psychedelic experiences which have got nothing to do with metaphysics and have got nothing to do with mysticism. For example, just simply laughing, maybe, with laughing gas. Or if you look at psychedelic experiences reported from the indigenous Americans um, in the South, you know, they, they have experiences where they um, become better warriors, or better hunters, or where they can heal their friends or curse their enemies. It doesn't really relate to metaphysics or mysticism. But nonetheless, there is an overlap, and it's in that overlap um, where I think um, Whitehead's metaphysics can be beneficial. So I'm just going to give you now a few examples of metaphysical experience. Um, to, why? Because when people have these experiences in therapy, um, my argument is that if we can frame those experiences in some kind of metaphysical system, it, will, it can aid the um, significance of those experiences to people undergoing therapy. So just a few experiences here. This is from the uh, astrophysicist Carlo Rovelli. He writes, quote, LSD was an extraordinarily strong experience that touched me also intellectually. Among the strange phenomena was a sense of time stopping. Things were happening in my mind, but the clock was not going ahead. The flow of time was not passing anymore. It was a total subversion of the structure of reality. That's what got him into physics, that experience, he writes. Um, from the great philosopher of mind, Ye Won Kim, who died only a couple of years ago, he writes, why are there just these qualia, like colors, sounds, whatever, and not other possible ones? That remains a mystery. It's interesting, with a number of um, psychedelic experience, experiences, you can, uh, you can, you can have a novel qualia. You have qualia which just cannot be categorized as a color, a sound, an emotion, a feeling, or whatever. They're just completely alien. I'll come back to that when we think about um, eternal objects. Richard Ward, 1957, on LSD. It's impossible to convey the horror of us being threatened with sheer nothingness, the fear of infinity. I wished I had the courage to try and find out where one is if one is nowhere. It's not always positive, these experiences, I should say. Um, <clears throat> here's one on uh, nature connectedness. Quite an extreme form of prehension, you might, you might think. Quote, I found my awareness slipping inside that of the daffodil. While still being conscious of sitting in the chair, I could also sense my petals. Then an exquisite sensation cascaded through me, and I knew I was experiencing light falling on those petals. It was virtually orgasmic, the haptic equivalent of an angelic choir. This is from uh, my colleague, a research fellow at Exeter, um, also based, well, based in uh, Brazil. Uh, Dr. Luis Eduardo Luna, who's an anthropologist and specialist in ayahuasca, which is a kind of um, psychedelic brew. Quote, it's impossible to understand Amerindian animist culture without reference to these psychedelic plants. So when you look at the um, Amerindian cultures um, who commonly use psychoactive substances, um, they are completely correlated with uh, a metaphysics that they have, which is generally animist. And of course, animism is the is very much related to panpsychism, pan-experientialism. Um, from Richard Ward again, um, relating to panpsychism, I realized on 100 micrograms LSD that the whole universe is made up of things <clears throat> which have their own natures, relationships, significances, and that in some universal scale, each thing has its proper degree of awareness. Alan Watts, um, on pantheism, that nature is God, the individual discovers himself to be one continuous process with God, with the universe. To those who have known it, it is as real and overwhelming as falling in love. Benny Shannon, who went to the Americas and created really the first taxonomy um, of the ayahuasca experience, he, he concludes, concludes that research thus. Overall, ayahuasca induces a comprehensive metaphysical view of things. I would characterize it as an idealistic monism with pantheistic overtones. I'm not quite sure what that means. 
Um, two minutes, right. Reality is conceived as constituted by one non-material substance, which is identified as cosmic consciousness. Spinoza would accept them. Albert Hoffman um, quotes Goethe, referencing Spinoza. In the last um, chapter of his book, he writes, what more can a person gain in life than that God nature reveals himself to him? God nature, of course, referring to Spinoza's thought that God is nature. <clears throat> Integration phase. Very quickly, I've got two minutes. Right, so um, psychedelics... Um, People get to know the therapists, they take the drug in a clinical atmosphere, and then they go through integration. Now, what is integration? Um, it, there are various methods of integration. There's at least 10 core methods, none of which involve metaphysics at all. Um, so my contention, then, is that um, these core experiences, which have a therapeutic effect in psychedelic um, therapy, um, those experiences can be amplified through um, understanding, through a kind of metaphysical menu at the last stage, that what they've experienced need not necessarily be a delusion. Rather, it could be veridical, it could be objectively true. For example, a panentheistic insight. This is where Whitehead, for example, comes in and says, <coughs> makes a good rational case for these kind of metaphysical experiences. So that, therefore, you place the metaphysical experience within a metaphysical system. My contention is by doing this, um, a person might attain, a participant might attain a longer term health benefit because they are less likely to dismiss their experiences as delusive. Because they will quickly, although at the time there's a noetic quality, as William James says, to the experience, um, at the time they, th they might feel it's real, as they return to our culture, they will think, no, that that must be wrong in, that, in our physicalist culture. So offering them in a, an intelligible manner this m metaphysical menu might allow for them to gain extra significance from that experience in terms of panentheism, prehension, especially in terms of nature connectedness, and um, in many other ways. So um, I've got a lot more to say, but I realize I'm out of time. So thank you for your time. So I start in the same sequence as we gave the presentations. So Peter, um, we know that the effects from like DMT or other drugs, um, so that they have a therapeutic effect is because they make it easier to rewire the brain. So they give us more neural plasticity so that if a person has, for example, an addiction problem after a DMT session, they can easily rewire their brain, and often they do, so that they get rid of the addiction problem. So what would metaphysics do? Would metaphysics also rewire our brains then? Or, um, uh, or would we just like have a, the Whiteheadian plane is like a conceptual trip up, so, and then we, we, need, we need to land after the conceptual trip and have a, a, a deeper experience? Or is it more like, and that's what I think, actually. It's more like Frankel's logotherapy that at some point we have to make sense of it all because humans are meaning creatures. We want meaning, and metaphysics gives us meaning. So what, yeah. what in addition to the drug experience, does metaphysics really give us? Okay. Hmm. Well, um, it's interesting because there are developments now to create psychedelic drugs which have no phenomenology at all, so that they only work on the, uh, on the brain. Um, but there are many skeptics um, relate, you know, for, for that procedure. Number one, because psychedelic means mind manifesting, so it's not really a psychedelic if it doesn't manifest the mind. Secondly, though, I think it's related to your, um, your work on mental causation to some extent, that the real um, therapeutic mechanism of psychedelics is that it creates, as it were, a small self. It, makes, um, it gives people a perspective on their life where their life and their problems are, become relatively unimportant. And their table of values um, uh, changes, is altered. So um, therefore, as a result of which, they don't need to, for example, mask their problems with alcohol because their problems seem relatively irrelevant. Um, what... What, the mechanism of that, of course, is the experience itself. It's a, what I call you know, a metaphysical experience. 
So that is, I would say, you know, a crucial aspect of that psychedelic therapeutic process. Um, of course, it would be correlated to the brain in some manner, but I don't think, you know, um, as a Whiteheadian, that you know you get the full causal sufficiency by looking at matter only or our abstraction that is matter. Um, you have to realize that matter is an abstraction which includes mind, and therefore the um, phenomenological sort of downward causation of such an experience is as causally efficacious as uh, anything in the brain. As a, as a quick answer. Thank you very much. Um, Sherry. Hi, thank you to all of you. That was really fascinating. Um, my question's for Peter, but I want to frame it by just um, speaking to Merlin's point, the emphasis you made on interdisciplinary scholarship. Um, it's a wholehearted belief of mine that transdisciplinary praxis is absolutely fundamental if we are to properly shift consciousness and change the paradigm incontrovertibly. Um, I'm specifically interested in my, my PhD research in the intersection of cosmology, higher dimensional mathematics, quantum mechanics and aesthetics. With that in mind, considering psychedelic experiences and um, from com a conversation I had with the mathematician Ralph Abraham, I understand psychedelics to basically be blasting a hole through the dimensions. Do you think metaphysics is enough in terms of helping people integrate their experience um, and actualizing the potential of psychedelics and shifting consciousness? Is metaphysics enough, seeing as that could be relegated by mainstream scientists as purely philosophical speculation? Don't we need some sort of cosmological grounding that substantiates metaphysical speculation? What comes first, physics or metaphysics? You know, this is, <laughs> this is, I won't answer that. I'd say, first of all, let's say it's, it's not enough. It's not sufficient metaphysics integration for psychedelic experience. Um, I always suggest that it's an additional and optional tool that a therapist can, can make use of. And I've spoken to many uh, um, therapists on the ground who are, you know, would appreciate such a tool. Because like I say, it is a metaphysical experience, right? Um, so I don't, number one, I don't think it is sufficient, but I think it's Im very important. Um, secondly, do we need to ground metaphysics in a sort of, in a cosmology that is um, respected by physicists? I mean, I think, you know, I think, I think, I think we do. I think, you know, physics is insufficient, generally speaking, for a start. I mean, we know that you know, the basic problem of physics is, you know, relativity theory doesn't go here with quantum theory, number one, so we know it's incomplete, but secondly, it doesn't say much, any, if anything, about the mind. And so obviously we, we can foresee that, that the future developments will be a fusion between physics and psychology. But of course, to a certain extent, that's what Whitehead provides. Um, so I think that, um, you know, and the people in this audience, of course, who work on um, trying to ground physics in a in a Whiteheadian metaphysics, so that's the way I personally see the future, but there's obviously other futures. With regard to one extra, third thing, with regard to um, dimensions of space and psychedelic experience, I've, in my book over there, right, the last chapter is on n dimensional space in relation to psychedelic experience, and that interestingly relates to some of what Whitehead said in an essay called Uniformity and Contingency. Uh, he speaks about dreams and dimensions of space in relation to relativity. But it's very interesting if you apply that to psychedelic experience, which uh, you can see as kind of excessive dreams in many ways. Great, thank you. Uh, Stephen Smith, uh, both to Peter and Merlin potentially here. When you were talking about coming into the, after the uh, psychedelic experience and starting to work with the integration, integrating the metaphysics in, particularly with a focus on nature relatedness and developing a deeper sort of conductivity between the human and the natural world. Can you develop that a little bit more? And because after the psychedelic experience, there's clearly an afterglow, and then there's a period where it tends to taper off when you look at some of the studies looking at nature relatedness. How would you sustain that? And then, you know, Merlin, I mean, picking up on the biological relatedness, is there a way to, in this metaphysics of the interrelatedness, to bring in the role of fungi in, uh, in, in, as an example of that? Just curious what your thoughts are. Yeah, well, um, <clears throat> there's, a, there's a number of empirical studies, as you might know, then, on nature connectedness. So, number one, um, there's a correlation between uh, nature connectedness, which we could define in many ways, um, and mental health. So there's that, and that sort of then um, infuses a number of uh, 
a lot of investment in companies. Um, and then there's secondary empirical uh, research led especially by a guy called Sam Gandhi on how psychedelics can induce nature connectedness and thus help mental health. And, um, you know, I've spoken to Sam Gandhi about this and, you know, that, the, that's a description. That's, you know, sort of, a, that's what seems to happen. But, you know, from a more metaphysical point of view, the interesting question is, like, why? You know, why does it induce that or what does it mean? Is that nature connectedness a mere delusion, like a, one of a hallucination, as it were, that psychedelics can induce? Or is there some kind of um, truth to it? Is there some verticality to that nature connectedness? So, and this is where I think um, Whitehead especially becomes important with regard to his concept of prehensions, which I consider really the key, his, his, his greatest uh, gift to humanity. So, why? Because um, the concept, very, yeah, I'm preaching to the converted here, but you know, as, you, as, you, as you know very basically, um, the theory of prehension is one of direct connection to nature, to uh, the outside world. Well, immediately one's past, but of course, that's um, one is an abstraction, one is part of you know, the environment. So it's an immediate connection um, to that which one sees. It's direct, he, that's why he's a realist as opposed to an idealist. That's why it's called process and reality. We relate, you know, after Bradley's um, appearance in reality, right? He was a, an idealist. So what Whitehead can provide more than any other philosopher, I believe, works on to a certain extent with his concept of sympathy, if you know that, which I think influenced Whitehead a bit. But what Whitehead's metaphysics can provide is um, a good solid foundation to explain that nature connectedness that it seems that psychedelics can amplify. And how can that generally lead to therapy? Well, I think that, again, what it means is in that afterglow period you speak about, where people are more open to metaphysical change, um, it can provide people with good reasons to accept that um, prehension of nature connectedness, again, as veridical and not something to be dismissed later on also provides um, a criticism of one's general metaphysic. You know, uh, you c there is no such thing as a neutral me like metaphysic. You can't avoid it, right? You're sort of born into it. So I think, <clears throat> I think that's how um, why he can be used practically in these, in these trials. That's only in the clinic. Of course, for so-called healthy people, um, it can enrich their life. And um, there's, I think, the future, at the present, you know, the, the medicinal route is important. It gives a kind of credibility to psychedelic research, but, um, Looking to the future, if we take it carefully, unlike what happened in the 50s, 60s, um, there could be some societal enrichment um, there as well, and that's where Whitehead could play a pivotal role. Um, just quickly to say that um, I think of fungi as a kind of ecological poster organisms. Um, all life is lived with other organisms. Uh, ecology is the study of the thicket of relationships um, that house all organisms in, in their place and in their time. Um, so I think fungi can help us to think about relation. They can help us to figure uh, ecological relations, but they, um, they aren't the only organisms that do that. So I think perhaps the reasons why some of these um, spending time outside in, in so-called nature connection can be helpful is because we are returning to uh, a state of being with um, and being with that which is not just human. Um, and so in returning to that kind of condition, uh, we are uh, uh, able to um, find our, our, our healthy, um, remember what it means to be healthy. What it means to be healthy is, is to be with. Um, it's the togetherness that puts the con uh, in concrescence, I've always, I've always assumed. Maybe I'm wrong there. Uh, what is left to me is to thank Peter, Sherry, and Merlin for a wonderful session. Well, psychedelics, fungi, and the inner eschaton sounds like a good 70s band, doesn't it? <laughs> With you all are musicians there. We are entering a break time. We have coffee in the back. We will start the last session of the day promptly at 4 o'clock. So we'll see you then.